The focus of this training course so far has been related to estimating dam and levee performance. An important but overlooked part of the risk assessment is the estimation of potential failure mode specific breach parameters used in the hydraulic breach modeling, which will inform the consequence evaluation. Estimating breach parameters should not be an afterthought, and it is not just the responsibility of the hydraulic engineer. Module 17 will focus on the estimation of initial breach parameters for internal erosion potential failure modes. The learning objectives for this module are explain breach parameters needed for hydraulic and consequence modeling, estimate breach parameters for embankment dams and levees, and explain why breach parameters for rock fill dams are different than earth fill dams. This presentation will provide an overview of embankment dam breach parameters and discuss various methods to obtain their initial estimates. While most of the focus in research and tools is on earth fill dams, there is considerably less information on breaching of rock fill dams. Some suggested approaches for estimating initial breach parameters for rock fill dams will be provided. Lastly, a brief overview of the RMC breach parameter suite will be provided. Overview. The estimation of a breach location, dimensions, and development time are critical aspects of a risk assessment. The breach parameters will directly affect the estimated peak outflow, as well as any possible warning time available to locations downstream or in the levied area. Unfortunately, the breach location, size, and formation time are often the most uncertain pieces of information in a dam or levee breach analysis. Breach dimensions and development time must be estimated for every failure scenario that will be evaluated. This includes different failure modes as well as different hydrologic events. Breach parameters can impact peak outflow, flood depth, flood velocity, timing, such as breach time, warning time, and arrival time and ultimately consequences. It is important to consider a range of parameter estimates for the breach size and development time for each failure scenario or event, and then perform a sensitivity analysis of the breach parameters to identify their effect on the outflow hydrograph, downstream stages and flows, and warning time to any population at risk. A population at risk at the toe of the dam will likely not be sensitive to the breach parameters due to their close proximity, i.e. no warning time and greater flood depths and velocities. But population at risk further downstream may be very sensitive to the breach parameters. If the results of the risk assessment appear to be sensitive to breach parameters, multiple life loss estimates should be obtained to get a rough estimate of the uncertainty. When performing a dam or levee breach analysis, teams must first estimate the characteristics of the breach. Once the breaching characteristics are estimated, the Hydrologic Engineering Center's River Analysis System, or HEC-RAS, can be used to compute the outflow hydrograph from the breach and perform the routing. The HEC-RAS software requires the user to enter the following information to describe a breach. The user will identify a piping failure mode for internal erosion and specify a piping coefficient used to compute piping slash pressure flow. The user will also specify the breach dimensions, critical breach development time, and trigger elevation. During a piping breach, the movement of water through the dam is modeled as a pressurized orifice type of flow. The rate of water flowing through the dam is modeled with an orifice pressure flow equation, which requires a discharge coefficient or a measure of how efficiently the flow can get into the pipe orifice. Because a piping failure is not a hydraulically designed opening, it is assumed that the entrance is not very efficient. Recommended values for the piping slash pressure flow coefficients are in the range of 0.5 to 0.6. 
The physical description of the breach in HEC RAS consists of the height of the breach, breach width, and side slopes in horizontal to vertical ratio. These values represent the maximum breach size and must be estimated outside of HEC RAS and entered into the program. Many regression equations discussed later use the average breach width, but HEC RAS requires the breach bottom width for input. HEC RAS requires the user to enter what is called the Critical Breach Development Time, or Breach Formation Time. The HEC RAS Breach Starting Time for a piping failure is considered to be when a significant amount of flow and material are coming out of the failure piping hole. The Breach Ending Time is considered to be when the breach is, for the most part, fully formed. In other words, significant erosion has not stopped not the time until the reservoir pool is emptied. The breach formation time must be estimated outside of HEC RAS and entered into the program. The breach progression curve is used by HEC RAS during the breach formation time to adjust the growth rate of the breach. By default, the breach progression is assumed to be linear between the breach initiation and the full breach size or full formation time. But a sine wave or user-defined curve can also be selected. These default HEC RAS options typically only model the main part of formation and widening phases, capturing the main surge of the breach formation in hydrograph, which typically lasts no more than several hours. The duration on either end of the main surge can be minutes to hours to days. The simplified physical breach method in HEC RAS can be used to define the entire breach process from start to finish. Downcutting and widening erosion rates as a function of velocity are user specified. This method is used for modeling levee breaches. This slide steps through a timeline for an internal erosion failure mode for a dam or levee that is watched, in other words, eyes on the dam or levee and a well-defined emergency action plan. The time periods requiring geotechnical input and discussion will be highlighted. Breach formation in HEC RAS begins at time zero. Beyond this time, the breach is virtually certain to form because intervention is unsuccessful and the failure mode is progressed enough that flows begin to increase rapidly due to gross enlargement of a pipe or loss of crest, followed by collapse, downcutting, and widening. Hazard or breach occurrence in life sim also begins at time zero. The likelihood of breach in the event tree corresponds to this time. The timeline begins with failure mode initiation. For example, amount of observed material movement suggests a pipe has initiated and is progressing towards the reservoir. This defines the beginning of the initiation phase of the breach process. For this example, it is shown occurring 36 to 12 hours before the breach starts to form and therefore negative values. Assuming adequate training and surveillance, the failure mode is likely to be detected shortly after it initiates if the seepage or leakage exit is observable. The time period from when the failure mode is detected up until recognition that breach is virtually certain to occur is the window of opportunity for intervention actions to arrest the failure mode development. The imminent hazard identification time is the time relative to breach formation at time zero when someone recognizes that the breach is going to occur or is occurring, determines that the population at risk needs to be evacuated, and initiates the warning and evacuation process. This time can happen before or after the hazard occurs. For internal erosion, this is usually associated with significant material movement being observed, unsuccessful intervention, and recognition that breach is virtually certain to occur. Therefore, the imminent hazard identification likely occurs before formation for dams or levees that are watched.
The team will need to discuss whether there is ample warning, typically minus six to minus two hours, or minimal warning, typically minus two hours to zero hours, based on the failure mode and other site-specific factors. Since these times are relative to time zero, when the breach starts to form, they are also negative values. Here is the remainder of the warning and evacuation timeline in LifeSim. The time periods can move relative to each other and are unique to each emergency management agency. Therefore, they are not shown here to a specific time. However, in a relative sense, an optimistic warning and evacuation scenario is shown, which begins prior to the start of breach formation. Whether or not a safe destination is reached by the mobilized population at risk depends on the evacuation speed and flood wave arrival time. Around the time when the peak breach outflow occurs is the completion of the formation phase of the breach process. Breach formation time in HEC RAS was previously discussed in this presentation. The breach then widens due to erosion of the breach sad walls. This slide illustrates the differences in the timeline for an internal erosion failure mode for a dam or levee that is not watched. In other words, no eyes on the dam or levee. This often occurs for dams that are not staffed and the public is not nearby to detect a developing failure mode, or levees that are not being inspected or flood fought during an event. There is no intervention like the previous example. A key difference is that the imminent hazard identification likely occurs after the breach has formed and reports of flooding start to appear downstream of the dam or within the levied area. It typically occurs zero to plus two hours after the breach starts to form. And in this example, it is shown after the peak breach outflow is released. Here is the remainder of the warning and evacuation timeline in LifeSim. As before, the time periods can move relative to each other and are unique to each emergency management agency. Therefore, they are not shown here to a specific time. However, in a relative sense, the time periods for the remainder of the warning and evacuation timeline occur after breach formation and peak breach outflow. The available time to reach a safe destination can be significantly reduced for this scenario, resulting in greater likelihood of fatalities. Embankment dams. Breach parameter estimation is not just an activity performed by the hydraulic modeler. Geotechnical input to the process is critical in determining the appropriate placement of the breach, soil material properties, and erodibility, for example. Therefore, similar to estimating probabilities of failure, initial breach parameters should be discussed and estimated in a team setting. The objective is to obtain reasonable breach estimates given modeled flow conditions in HEC RAS. This is an important risk cadre activity. It is not a formal elicitation process. First, the risk driver potential failure modes should be reviewed to determine which breach scenarios will be evaluated. Each individual potential failure mode may require a unique breach scenario or it may be possible to model several potential failure modes with a single breach scenario. Also, similar to estimating probabilities of failure, the team should make use of multiple methods, in other words, case histories, regression equations, and physically based models when appropriate, to estimate final breach bottom width, breach side slope ratio, and breach formation time, but not all may be given equal weight or any weight depending on project specific factors. The parameters obtained from a review of those methods should then be compared against USACE 2007 guidelines, if appropriate. Lastly, the team should estimate the velocity or range that the embankment will continue to erode based on judgment considering the materials and flow conditions. The outcome of this suggested process is to provide the hydraulic modeler some team input on reasonableness and a sandbox to play in. These steps are discussed in more detail on the following slides.
Potential breach characteristics can be estimated in several ways, including comparative analysis, which is comparing your dam or levee to historical failures of similar size, materials, and water volume. Regression equations, which are equations developed from historical failures to estimate peak outflow or breach size and development time. Utilization of velocity or shear stress versus erosion rates and physically based computer models or software that attempts to model the physical breaching process using sediment transport or erosion equations, soil mechanics, and principles of hydraulics. All of these methods are viable techniques for estimating breach characteristics. However, each of these methods has strengths and weaknesses and should be considered as a way of estimating the parameters and not used as absolute values. If the dam under consideration is very similar in size and construction to one or more dams that have failed and the failures are well documented, appropriate breach parameters or peak outflows may be estimated by comparison. Comparative analysis is a simplified approach that entirely neglects the breaching process to use case study data similar to the dam under consideration to develop direct estimates of the dam's breach parameters. In general, the database of well-documented dam failure case studies is small and contains few examples of very high dams or very large storage volumes. Reclamations DSO-98-004 by Tony Wall, 1998, is one of the most comprehensive databases. Frolic, 2008, is another well-known database. Zhu and Zhang, 2009, collected 182 failure cases, including some from China that were not previously available. Nearly one half are for high dams. Details of 75 failure cases had sufficient information for developing breach parameter models. This database is unique in that it attempts to characterize embankment erodibility. Ehas and Bowles, 2014, made the following major modifications to the Zhu and Zhang 2009 database and should be used instead. They changed breach development times to the commonly used definition, changed other breach parameters for consistency with Wall 1998 and Frolic 1995-2008, and changed some assigned erosion categories based on a review by Jean-Louis Briode. This slide presents an example from Tony Wall's Dam Failure Database to provide a sense of the type of data cataloged, which includes embankment characteristics and dimensions, hydraulic characteristics, and breach characteristics, such as dimensions, outflow, and time parameters. Teton Dam is highlighted. Prediction equations are another simplified approach to estimate breach parameters as a function of dam height, reservoir storage, and embankment volume. They have the same limitations as comparative analysis because the regression equations are based on the same databases. Some of the more common regression equations are listed on this slide. Only Zhu and Zhang 2009 incorporate erodibility as a predictor variable. As previously mentioned, Ehas and Bowles 2014 made major modifications to the Zhu and Zhang database. For the regression analysis, Bowles et al. 2014 indicated they eliminated case histories for concrete face dams and embankment dams with core walls or cutoffs and omitted all Chinese dams to avoid potential criticism associated with indirect access to the original references. As a result, significantly fewer case histories, or 27, were used to develop the revised Zhu Zhang equations then were used for the original equations, which included three low erosion category case histories, 11 medium erosion categories, and 13 erosion categories, seven overtopping failures, and 20 internal erosion failures. It should be noted that there were several typographic and potentially logic errors in the published Bowles et al. 2014 regression equations. Physically based dam breach models are gaining more popularity in practice. These models use principles of hydraulics, sediment transport, 
and head cutting to simulate the development of the breach. This approach is more difficult, but also operates the, offers the potential for more detailed results, such as prediction of breach initiation time and prediction of intermediate breach dimensions, as well as ultimate breach parameters. The use of physically based erosion and dam breach modeling is justified or practical when breach parameters cannot be predicted using established regression equations, or it will help address the will it fail question. Several examples are listed here. Only Windam C and DL breach are free to download. Both can simulate breaches due to internal erosion or piping. This table from the best practices manual compares the various physically based breach models. On the far right is NWS breach, which is a sediment transport model. It is free to download from rivermechanics.net. To the left of it is HR Breach from HR Wallingford, which can evaluate piping and zoned embankments. Unfortunately, it is not free. As previously mentioned, Windam and DL Breach can simulate breaches due to internal erosion and piping. Since both are free to download, they are highlighted in the first two columns, with the differences between the two models appearing in a blue font. Windam B from the Natural Resources and Conservation Service does not evaluate piping. It only assesses spillway and overtopping erosion. Windam C has the additional capability to evaluate piping in a homogeneous embankment. It uses the excess shear stress equation based on KD and tau critical that were previously discussed in this training course. The model will eventually be expanded to handle zoned embankments in the future. Where surface protection is present, Windam can assess its effectiveness and estimate the time for its removal, in other words, a delay in overtopping erosion process. Dam and Levy Breach, or DL Breach, from Clarkson University can evaluate piping and cohesive and cohesionless, homogeneous and zoned embankments. The model considers non-equilibrium sediment transport model and simulates cohesive embankment breach erosion processes by head cut migration and breaching of composite embankments with clay core and cover. It can handle both one and two direction breaches for modeling of coastal and estuarine levee and barrier breaching. DL breach has been incorporated into HEC RAS. Many federal agencies have published guidelines in the form of ranges of values for breach width, side slopes, and development time. The USACE guidelines are highlighted in this table from Bruner 2014. After using any of the three previously discussed methods, the initial dam breach parameters should be compared to these guidelines, as well as physical constraints like non-erodible structures, abutments, or valley floor. The guidelines in this table should be used as minimum and maximum bounds for estimating breach parameters. The note at the bottom of the table is very important. Dams that have large storage volume, low erodibility, and long crests will erode longer and may have larger breach widths than what is shown in the table. In addition to the initial breach parameters, teams must also estimate the velocity or range of velocities that the team thinks that the embankment will continue to erode based on judgment considering the materials and flow conditions. The hydraulic modeler will use this information to review the HEC RAS model and adjust accordingly. Various methods are compiled in the RMC Critical Velocity Toolbox, which is part of the RMC Spillway Erosion Suite. A check for reasonableness should be performed by evaluating the breach flow and velocities through the breach during the breach formation process. This can be accomplished by reviewing the detailed output for the inline structure or dam and reviewing the flow rate and velocities going through the breach. This output is provided on the HEC RAS detailed output table for the inline structure. There are two things to check. If the HEC RAS model reaches the full breach development time and size, 
and there are still very high flow rates and velocities going through the breach, either the breach is too small or the breach development time is too short, unless there are some physical constraints limiting breach SAS. Adjust the breach SAS and development time to improve the estimates. If the flow rate and velocities through the breach become very small before the breach has reached its full size and development time, either the breach size may be too large or the breach time may be too long. Adjust the breach size and development time to improve the estimates. Levies. A USACE levy incident and breach data collection effort is in progress. Some of the general findings on breach width and depth are summarized on this slide on the levy segments reviewed so far. Breach widths along the levy alignment range from 30 to 4,000 feet with an average of about 500 feet. Average ratio of breach depth to levy loading height ranged from 0.5 to 7.5 with an average of 2.3 as measured from top of levy. There are no widely accepted empirical equations for levee breach dimensions, lateral erosion rates, or breach development time. Zamorati 2020 selected 55 data sets from international levee failures to derive empirical curves and equations for levee breach parameters as a function of levee height only. USACE does not utilize these equations, but the database plots a breach width levy erosion and breach development time as a function of levy height are shown on this slide. The legend in the blue box applies to all three figures, and the block data points are for piping or other factors. Using levy height is convenient, but probably too simplistic. Danka and Zhang 2015 created a database of over 1,000 levy failure cases and found about 14% of historical breaches were due to internal erosion. One of their conclusions was that the breach length for external and internal erosion was often longer than that developed by failure mechanisms of local nature, such as slope failure, horizontal sliding, or failure of embedded structures. They developed multivariate empirical equations for estimating breach length, breach depth, and peak discharge as a function of levy height, levy width, type of levy, levy material, and failure mechanism, which included piping. USACE does not use these equations, but the general conclusions and database plots of breach width as a function of levy height and levy width are shown on this slide. Although more control variables were used than levy height and width, neither sets of regression equations presented on these two slides consider flood duration. A simplified physical breaching method is included in HEC RAS to calculate the development of levy breach geometry vertically and horizontally as a function of the velocity of the flow through the breach. The user selects breach widening and downcutting relationships, which are then used dynamically to estimate breach progression as a function of the actual velocity being computed through the breach on a time step by time step basis. The methodology for levy breach widening uses the excess shear stress equation discussed in the erodibility parameters presentation, boundary shear stress at the toe of the breach sidewall, assuming a rectangular breach cross section, and Manning's equation. The figure on the right illustrates the relationships using the recommended erodibility coefficients for four erosion categories based on a review of the NCHRP database developed by Briode and others in 2019, and assuming zero critical shear stress. The previous three relationships are shown as dashed lines. This serves as a starting point for inundation models. While this approach provides a much needed scientific basis for calculating levy widening rates, the results are very sensitive to the erodibility parameters and additional research is still needed. USACE has developed a breach data plotting tool to display breach data from HDF5 files in a graphical form.
An example is shown on this slide, which shows headwater and tailwater, breach width, and velocity through the breach as a function of time. As previously mentioned, levee widening rates are very sensitive to the erodibility parameters, and geotechnical input and review are critical. Breaching of rock fill dams is different than earthen fill dams. This section will summarize the current understanding of the process and provide some suggested guidance and approaches for estimating breach parameters of rock fill dams. There is a small number of case histories for large rock fill dams with low erodibility, and this is likely due to the intrinsic safety of this type of dam. No modern rock fill dam has failed from internal erosion in recent times. Modern zoned central core rock fill dams are more erosion resistant than other low erodibility dams in the Zhu and Zhang 2009 data set. The table at the top left summarizes historical accidents with the three largest reservoir volumes highlighted. The table at the bottom left summarizes historical failures, and these are all due to overtopping. The two largest dams in the table, Oros and Hilho, failed due to overtopping during construction. The table at the upper right summarizes, summarizes large embankment dam failures in the past 50 years. The list includes Tomsok and Tokwe Mukosi Rockfill dams. However, Tomsok failed due to overtopping and Tokwe Mukosi did not fail. The table at the bottom right is from Zhu and Zhang 2009. Only three large embankment dams with heights greater than 15 meters with low erodibility are in the database, and all three are outside the United States. Dong and Guohao were two large Rockville Dam case histories from China. All of this makes comparative analysis difficult. These plots of average breach width and breach formation time as a function of volume above breach invert were generated from the DSO-98-004 database. The trend line is drawn through Helho, Oros, and Teton dams for reference. USAIS estimated breach parameters for Mosul Dam in Iraq as part of a risk assessment. Mosul Dam is a very large rock fill dam, and the range of parameter estimates are highlighted in yellow. These plots illustrate that large rock fill dams will be in the upper right corner of database of all dam failures highlighting again the difficulty in using case studies and comparative analysis. Several laboratory tests were carried out at the Technical University of Lisbon in Portugal to better understand the breaching process and characterize the final breach configuration. The dam models were 0.5 meters high with upstream and downstream slopes of one and a half horizontal to one vertical. 0.2 meters wide and 2 meter long crest, and had a dam volume of about 0.9 cubic meters and a reservoir capacity of about 2.7 cubic meters. The breach mechanism of rock fill dams, according to the test, is different from what is usually described for failures of earthen dams. The deposition of eroded rock fill immediately downstream of the dam limits the rate of breach development and has a stabilizing effect. And the length of rock deposition downstream of the dam is about one and a half times the dam height. The average lateral erosion rate of the breach is about 80% of the average bottom erosion rate. Key observations of the breach final configuration are shown in the figure at the bottom right. The geometry that best fits the breach final configuration is parabolic. Final top width of the breach is approximately 2.25 times the dam height. Final average width of the breach is approximately 1.7 times the dam height. Final breach depth is approximately 0.8 times the dam height. Lateral slope of the breach banks is slightly smaller than the angle of repose. In some cases, the breach walls are nearly vertical due to coarser material. The profile along the breach axis presents at the upstream a negative concavity, which corresponds to the flow control section. Afterwards, a positive concavity, and finally, at the downstream, a negative concavity, 
which corresponds to rock deposition downstream of the dam resulting from its erosion. Erodibility is an important parameter. Brio's erosion categories bring erodibility down in complexity from erosion rate versus shear stress function to category number. This classification system can be presented in terms of velocity or shear stress. Categories are based on 15 years of erosion testing experience and rate of erosion of soil and rock materials by water flowing over a horizontal surface as measured by the erosion function apparatus. Erosion rate scale ranges over several orders of magnitude. If the Teton Dam failure took four hours for an erosion category of 2.6 with medium to high erodibility, and considering that the erosion categories are on a log scale, a rock fill dam failure, which may have an erosion category of four for low erodibility, would take much longer. In summary, rock fill dams are not represented well in case history databases and hence standard regression equations. As previously mentioned, the deposition of eroded rock fill immediately downstream of the dam can have a stabilizing effect. Balls et al. 2014 indicated that the rock fill material removed from the breaching process is deposited within a short distance downstream of the dam, causing a significant tailwater to develop that would reduce flow velocities through the breach, thus inhibiting both downward erosion and lateral development of the breach, with the result that a narrower and shallower breach would be formed, taking a longer time to form and resulting in a lower peak breach flow rate. This slide summarizes the process used for the Mosul Dam Breach Parameter Review to determine breach parameters applicable to a rock fill dam with a reservoir volume that is not represented in the failure databases. Include numerical conceptual breach models to inform estimates, account for the large uncertainty inherent in breach parameter estimates, and provide a defensible rationale for adopted parameters. The process starts with the range of breach widths based on the empirical database. Breach analysis was performed to determine minimum and maximum breach formation times that make sense from the perspective of flow through the breach. The breach analysis results were plotted over the empirical database. Results that are outside the envelopes of empirical data were screened. Judgment was used for the adopted breach formation and the basis of parameters and judgments and uncertainties were documented. These envelopes of empirical data are shown on this slide. On the left, breach average width as a function of volume above breach, considering Zhu and Zhang 2009 data set is shown. And on the right, the breach formation time as a function of volume above breach, considering Zhu and Zhang 2009 data set is shown. Toolbox Overview In the RMC Embankment Dam Failures Toolbox, there are separate worksheets for each of these case history databases. Filters are set up to sort by failure mode and embankment and hydraulic characteristics to find a similar dam to compare breach characteristics. Wall 1998 contains the most case histories at 108 and contains the most detailed information. It is recommended for usage. Froelich 2008 contains 74. McDonald and Longridge Monopolis 1984 contains 42. And Zhu and Zhang 2009, including the update performed by Ehas and Bowles 2014, contains 75. In the RMC Empirical Embankment Dam Breach Parameters Toolbox, there are separate worksheets for each of these regression equations. The geometric parameters and breach formation time from the various methods are summarized on a separate worksheet for comparison. Peak breach outflow from various methods are also included in the toolbox. References The primary references discussed in this presentation are on this slide. The primary references are continued on this slide. The primary references are concluded on this slide. This concludes this presentation.